Welcome back. Today we wanted to bring you an update video concerning a few topics that are near and dear to Pennsylvania hunters. And unless you were one of the two dozen or so people that attended the PA Game Commission's January 2020 staff meeting, you probably never know otherwise. I do want to thank Commissioner Mitrick and former Commissioner Daly for all of their time on the phone, as well as Dr. Corin Jagnow, the Commission's Human Dimension Specialist. She was also gracious enough to share her presentation with us that we'll be including here momentarily. Now this video is going to cover three of the state's big game species. The first 25 minutes or so, we'll take a look at white-tailed deer with Doctors Jagnow and Rosenberry. And then we'll move on and spend you know, six or seven minutes on turkeys with PGC's top turkey biologist, Mary Jo Casalina, followed by a dozen or so minutes with PA's bear titan, Mark Turnett, and then finally close with some eye opening remarks from former Commissioner Daly. There's a lot of great insight on the Saturday opener this year's proposed concurrent buck and doe season, as well as hints towards the future separate tags for turkeys notion. There's a pile more, so let's dive right in. Licenses. 
and compared to exactly one year before, so not the complete license year for last year, but just compared to that exact same day, we had sold 846,224 licenses. So that means that we had a 3,351 uh, license increase um, from December 31st of 2018 to this year, um, the same date, which was a 0.4% increase. I think it's also important to note in these last 36 years, um, we've only had 13 times where our licenses have gone up. So to even go up at all is somewhat unusual. So if we take a look here, um, that first year that we have there in the darker green on the left, that's the uh, 2016 licenses. So from 2015 to 16, we lost about 2.4% of our licensed buyers. Uh, 16 to 17, um, we lost about three and a quarter of our licensed buyers, three and a quarter percent. And then 2017 to 18, we lost about three and a half percent. But then you can see this year that orange bar on the far right, that's that 0.4% that we gained uh, for 18 to 19, for this at the end of the calendar year. So if we took that, if we assume that instead of uh, perhaps an increase this year, if we had continued to decline at a rate of about 3%, which is what those last three years were before that, if we had had a 3% loss, our license for this year at the end of uh, 2019 would have been 820,838. But instead, we sold 849,575. So really, from that 3%, if we would have continued to lose at that same average rate, um, we would have been 28,737 fewer licenses than what we actually had this year. So I think it's important to look at it this way if we had continued on that same path of losing about 3% a year like we have the last four years. So this just shows us also there's, a, when we bring the Saturday opener into this, this shows us a lot. So this is 2016, 2017, and 2018 from the first day of license sales through December 31st, each of those years. And this shows a lot of consistency in our license buying patterns. But then, as soon as we add this year, we see a few differences. So the blue line is the 2019, the first half of our license buying year. So we see uh, a little bit higher of a peak at the very beginning of the year. Um, and then we see uh, that the very end of the license year, where that's November 29th, which is the Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, which of course is the day before our Saturday opener. We see a much higher spike there than we do in the previous year. So we see a lot of people buying the, the biggest spikes there are typically, that's around July 5th, I think, of this year is when we sold a lot of licenses, and that's usually in anticipation of antlerless tags. We see that little blue one around the middle. I don't know if this will reach that far. That is usually the Friday before uh, archery season. So this just tells us a lot about when people buy, but almost always these spikes, especially as the year goes, are on Friday. We see a lot of people buy licenses the day before season starts. It certainly sounds like a pile of new license sales were directly attributable to the Saturday opener as evident by the press releases and media headlines. Yes, there's definitely a spike noted on Black Friday, but there's also a decrease in July. Procrastination on the part of hunters? Is it possible people who suggested they'd send a message last summer by not buying a license if the Game Commission changed opening day appeared to have stood their ground but knew in their heart of hearts they simply had to be in the woods and reluctantly bought their license at the last minute? The notion is certainly in line with Dr. Jagnow's reflection of the 2011 Plan versus Actual Behavior study, where she noted that only 39% of people actually do what they say they're going to do. So, if we take a little bit closer look and we find out, okay, we saw an increase and we haven't seen an increase in a while, where is this increase coming from? So, if we take a look at our young hunters, um, this is all young hunters, age 18 to 34, in 2018, we sold 192,000 licenses to that group. This year, we sold about 1,079 more licenses to them, so we're at 190,560. <coughs> so we had a 0.6%, 0.56% increase in that group. And if we take that same idea of, if we had continued on that same path of losing, we see here we had lost 3% from 15 to 16, 4% from 16 to 17, and another 4%. If we took that, and that's roughly an average of 3.6, but if we even went a little bit lower of a loss, and we assumed a 3.5% loss for this year, we would have lost 6,722 licenses instead of that gain of 1,079. So we're really looking there at a difference of about 7,800 licenses than maybe if we had continued to experience that loss like we had the years before. 
it's great that we have this visual showing that we didn't continue down the path with another three or four percent loss in 2019, but we really have to keep that three and a half percent in perspective. The state has historically experienced losses for you know three to five years in a row, followed by two or three years of small positive gains. Is this just another level set that has nothing to do with the opener? If you think about it, nothing changed in 2000, 2001, 2008, 9, 11, 12, or 13, but positive gains happened then too. That hypothetical figure of 7,800 more licenses sold this year is truly just that, a hypothetical, but it has become a talking point lately. If we talk now just about our resident license buyers, um, age 18 to 34, if we look, take a look at that November 29th right there. So the blue is this year, the orange color is from uh, the 2018, that uh, roughly June 17th to December 31st. Uh, November 29th was the single highest, this is, excuse me, the second highest day for license sales for this age group. The highest day is July 5th. And 5.6 of all of our licenses sold to our resident hunters, 18 to 34, was sold on November 29th, which is, of course, the day before our Saturday opener. Um, and if we take the entire week before, um, and we compare it to the uh, week before in 2018, so in 2018, that entire week was the Monday to Sunday before the Monday opener of our rifle deer season. And this year, it was a Saturday to a Friday before that Saturday opener. Uh, for this year, we sold 1,346 more licenses in that week leading up to the opening of general firearms deer season, which is a 7% increase. Okay, and next we look at, so well, a lot of the discussion that was had last year talks about, um, obviously, the schools are like K-12 schools. Most of them do have off that Monday after Thanksgiving, and the kids are able to go, but the colleges do not. So if kids have to go back to school after Thanksgiving, they typically would have classes in colleges that Monday morning immediately after. So will this have this positive impact for these uh, students that would be 18 to 21 who would be in college um, that time of the year? So for every single one of the groups, for 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 and 21 year olds from 2018 to 2019, we sold more licenses for all four of those age groups. So in, uh, for the total combined of those four ages, we sold 43,844 um, in the fall of 2018 compared to 44,911 sold this year. So right there in that group of our college age hunters, that's a 2.4% increase for 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, as you can see there, that was an even bigger loss annually uh, that we had experienced. So it was a 4% loss from 15 to 16 and then we lost 5% each of the two years after that. So that's, if we had assumed that we had continued on that same path of losing between four and five percent of our 18 to 21 year olds each year, um, we would have lost 1,973 licenses uh, for those four years of age there. Instead, um, we sold 44,911. So if we have that difference of a positive uh, 3,000 licenses just for 18 to 21. Here again, not paying too much attention to the hypotheticals, Understand that without seeing the full age spectrum, this data doesn't illustrate much with respect to how regulation changes may or may not have impacted license sales. As one age demographic moves out of a predetermined range, the data in that subset is going to drop, but it's also going to increase as a variable in the next range. The 18 to 21 demographic may have gone up in 2019, but were they already positioned to do so? Think of it this way. If our current group of 16 and 17 year old hunters is larger than that of our current 20 and 21 year olds who will be exiting out over the next two years, naturally, when those 16 and 17 year olds age into this 18 to 21 bracket, we wouldn't say we've gained all of these new college aged hunters they simply just graduated into the demographic. If we take a look here at our resident hunters um, age 18 to 21, this is the same idea, just taking a look at when they buy their licenses. So again, that uh, November 29th was also the second highest day compared to uh, July 5th being the biggest. Uh, 2,542 licenses sold to resident hunters 18 to 21 years old. 
and this is 6% of all the licenses were sold just that day before that Saturday opener. If we take a look then, that same idea is what we looked at for the 18 to 34 year olds, for 18 to 21 year olds, uh, in the seven days before the Bridal Beer opener, we sold uh, about 4,500 in 2018 and about 5,300 this year. That's 827 more individual licenses sold just in that one week, which is an 18% increase for that age group. Okay, next, um, talking about where some of the difference from this year to last year was. So we saw that we have 3,300 more uh, individual licenses sold this year. 616 of those came from a variety of resident license types, but non-residents made up the rest of them. So we saw that 2,700 of our additional licenses came from non-residents, which is about 82% of all of the increase came from them. And we had just a 5.6% increase in non-resident licenses sold in one year. This slide was passed over pretty quickly, so I want to take a second to talk about it because there are a couple of things here to think about. Remember, the 18 to 19 increase in total license sales was 3,351. Now, if non-residents made up 2,735 of that increase, did the Saturday opener really impact overall license sales? Did it impact the youth recruitment or retention needle? Of the entire 3,351 increase, more than 80% of them were out-of-state residents. Now, I don't know too many college kids who file for permanent residency out-of-state while attending college. The increase in license sales was more than likely attributed to doubling the length of the state's bear season. We are, after all, a destination state for bear hunters, as evident by the 202,043 licenses that were sold which was a record high figure and an increase of 30,000 compared to the prior year. So if we take a look here, we obviously see similar trends, but not exactly the same. We do not see that same beginning of the year activity from our non-resident license buyers, but then we see that November 29th just really going very high uh, for this particular group. And I think it's important to note, if someone is buying the day before, uh, they are probably almost certainly not actually buying online, that they're buying at some sort of licensed vendor, and with very, very few exceptions, they are in Pennsylvania. So that means they are probably in Pennsylvania. We have a hypothesis, and we can possibly test this with some survey research to see if perhaps this is extended family members or even children of people who just were able to stay for an extended Thanksgiving holiday and able to go hunting because it was a Saturday opener and they didn't have to return. We don't know that for sure. It seems possible though because they are buying it so late that they were already in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and, uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday. So if we just take a look then at when they buy, so obviously that really big spike, that was the single biggest day of purchase, which was pretty obvious from the graph. Uh, we sold a total of 51,662 non-resident licenses as of December 31st. Um, that's 6,112 non-resident licenses sold just on the one day, the day before the Saturday opener, which was nearly 12% of all of our non-resident licenses sold for the year. So you can see also, I think that graph shows something that's a little different than some of the uh, other graphs we saw was that this has gone and exceeded you know, the previous three years of our non-resident license. Well, just some quick uh, summary here of the key findings. Um, since 1982, our license sales have had an average loss of 1.4%, and they've only increased 13 times since 1982, including this year. And this was the first time that we've had an increase um, since the 2012 to 2013 season. We increased 0.4%. Um, our young hunters increased, so we had a 0.6% increase for our hunters 18 to 34, and a 2.4% increase for our hunters aged 18 to 21. Uh, our non-residents contributed a lot in the increase uh, in license sales, and we also saw that a very large percentage of our licenses were sold to young hunters and non-resident hunters in the day before and the few days leading up to the Saturday opener, which we, we just believe there's a relationship between the Saturday opener and the increase in those groups. That's everything I have. Any questions? Are there any questions, comments? Gordon, um, yes. in all of your studies and the work that you've done, how do those our license sales this year compare to the national average? Well, 
Um, we are typically second highest. So Texas is the only state that usually sells any more licenses than we do. Uh, it's funny, my boss, Steve Smith, right before we had done this, we did ask uh, some of the neighboring states. We didn't get responses from all of them, but they had experience. Three that replied to us did have losses this year, ranging from 2% to 8%. So, I mean, I think we were number one prior to Texas having they have a lot more people than we do now. And so I think for many years, we had sold the most licenses in the country. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? Any other comments? Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I think we're moving on to Derek then, all right? I was really disappointed that Derek didn't have anything to report from any additional focus groups or research findings since the last time he provided the commission with this bit of insight two weeks before they voted to finalize the change of opening day. Any potential increase of new participants um, from a younger age demographic is, is likely going to be you know, offset and countered by you know a loss in participation and I think participation rate is the key thing to keep in mind because even if you could say oh well, we have a new group of people that are now participating in deer hunting because they can go out with uh, the rest of the deer hunters on a op new opening day a Saturday opener that's going to likely be um, like I said offset by losses and people from our for core audience and the traditional participants. So I don't believe that it's, you know, a, a valuable decision or move to uh, change the, um, the opener simply based upon the potential, the unproven potential to draw in a brand new audience of participants. Let me ask you, okay, so we're gonna pick that apart a little bit. Sure, sure. I mean, I can't just let that achieve a specific antlerless harvest and ultimately it is the antlerless harvest regardless of season length that affects deer population abundance. Any questions? So hypothetically speaking, if every hunter was successful, theoretically we would harvest more deer in a one week period than we would in a two week period because of the allocation. Hypo hypothetical, right? Because this is this is in a dream world. Right. So if, if I were a king for the day, everybody gets to harvest their their antlerless deer. So we'd have more allocations in a one week. Yes. Yes. So we would actually kill more deer in a one week season than we would a two week season, hypothetically. <laughs> but, but we know that's not going to happen. Reality says that that's very unlikely. Flower King for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Dr. You, 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 did, you did say season does not affect the total harvest. In our system, the way we would set the allocation, the season length does not affect. As long as you know the season length going into your yes. allocation. Yes. Those adjustments can be made again, aiming for that specific harvest level. Going into the, before we make the allocation recommendation, we will have an idea of what we want that animal harvest to be. Knowing the season length, we would then adjust that allocation <coughs> to hit that targeted animal harvest. So my question is similar. I get a lot of questions in the conclusion about extending seasons, and they always, as a hunter, does bio, it have to be biologically supported? So this this is your calculation biologically made. We're going to increase hunter opportunity. This is the form that we use to adjust for them. That's as long as Commissioner yeah. or Commissioner Frederick said we have to look. We have to know ahead of time. Right. Yeah. Yes. We, we would make that adjustment with the allocation. Okay. Thank you. 
So the, just so I get everybody to understand exactly what we're discussing is that um, if we lengthen the season to a two-week season, we cut 25% of our no, no licenses off. That was an example. It would depend. It'll vary even. <laughs> One of us is killing this. <laughs> <laughs> It'll depend on the unit. Uh, for example, 2E, when it went from a 12 to a 7, we saw almost no change. So if we go from a 7 to a 12, there's probably not going to be much of a change in that allocation based on past history of that unit. 3C, for example, where that one did uh, require more tags, you would expect to see a bigger change or a bigger reduction in the allocation if that season is extended. So to make that blank statement, I can't do that, but unit by unit it will vary, but it'll be based on what we've seen in that unit in the past. My point is everybody, I mean there's different camps on this. But so uh, my point to that is is that there's two different camps of this. More people, some people want more opportunity, uh, some people want more tags or availability of tags. So if we lengthen the season, there is definitely going to be a, a reduction in the number of tags. And that's, I just want everybody to be aware of that situation. And a lot of people would be very unhappy uh, if that were to occur. Yeah. <clears throat> that was um, a decade ago. Some of those, that was some of the discussions that I was aware of when some of these changes were made. Uh, I think where we are today, the last three years, I think we're looking at 21 to 22 out of our 23 units still have endless tags available for the first round of unsold. Correct. So that, that demand that was there a decade ago is not there right now. So yeah, with the 12-day season, you know, maybe that demand pumps back up. I don't know, but right now what we've seen the last couple of years with our allocation sales is almost all of our units still have tags for that first round of unsold trying to go out and get a second. Chris, back in the day, what role did concurrency play? I think the original switch was from three days to a 12 day season. One of the biggest issues there was with those three days, the bulk of your harvest occurred on one day, that Monday. If that was bad weather, you lost an entire year of management opportunity, basically. And then you were trying to play catch up with the you know, It's very difficult to catch up after the week. Yeah. The 12 day season does spread that. Now with the, with the last year we would have had Saturday opener and two other Saturdays of a big harvest. Bad weather on one day or so may not be as big of an effect. And you can more consistently manage your deer population so you're not chasing a bad year trying to compensate for it. Um, and it, it does, it, it provides that, that greater opportunity and that's more days to hunt animals. And you can hit your target by patent uh, license issues. We can make this hard with license issuance and more likely, more consistent. And you're not, you're you're not, you're not rolling the dice on weather. Right. Where's the thought? Yeah, could you comment just a little bit on VMAP tags, especially in that 3C area? VMAP tags and 3C. Um, nothing stands out in my uh, memory on 3C. I don't think 3C is one of those units where we see a, a large component of uh, EMAP. It's, it's to, the, to the west, some of those units, we see a large component of EMAP. 3C, if it's like many of the other units, I think we're looking at less than, or maybe around five or less percent change in the ambus harbors as a result of EMAP. So in 3C, I don't, I can't recall offhand that EMAP's a very large component. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Our fall turkey harvests have been declining, but we've seen, you know, from our very recent um, hen study that fall harvest still does regular um, harvest. That is our, you know, only real tool that we have in the toolbox that we can um, show effective uh, immediate change. With that said, <coughs> all harvest. Have, do you have any data to support or <coughs> comment on success 
straight by firearm, <laughs> rifles versus shotgun. I I guess you don't have success rate. I mean, I have harvest by um, rifle versus shotgun. I have actual harvest. <coughs> I guess what I'm driving at is rather than shorten you know, the opportunity, could we do something to take the effectiveness of the so we can keep the seasons to you know, the opportunities there? And, and I think you know the reason I'm asking is back in the day, southwestern Pennsylvania, the shotgun zone, and back around 2008, 2009, we allowed fire, we allowed rifles into the fall season. Did you notice a, a, a more effective, a more effective harvest? Um, actually, I didn't notice a, a more effective harvest. Part um, turkey hunter success uh, remains, you know, pretty low uh, for for the fall season, and. Um, but this past, the last two years, fall turkey hunter success has been increasing. But I mean, you're talking going from 8% to like 10% or 11%. So you're still, our overall harvests are still pretty low. Um, harvest success is still low. Right, right, right. I mean, again, you're going from 8 to 10% of what? Right. <laughs> Shotgun? No, just overall hunter success. Hunter success. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of rifle versus shotgun, I don't have the, the numbers um, at the top of my head, but the percentage of the harvest from um, from rifles has increased just but very slightly. Uh, really, the the noticeable um, firearm that has increased is um, is crossbow. We're definitely getting uh, a higher. We have you know that's now I think like 14 to 15 percent of the harvest. Is now from um, all those, and most of that is from rifles. Yeah. If you were, you, are you able to make a guess about rifles? If you don't want to, you don't want to. Um, I could, I could get you that information. It's on my computer. I mean, we, we, so. do you agree or disagree? Because I mean, I know you work very closely with the turkey hunting public and NWTF. Yeah. I mean, is that is that a social bombshell? to even talk about providing more hunting opportunity days by reducing the effectiveness of, of the harvest rate by firearm? Well, I would think that if we would want to, if we were going to do that, I would think that we would want to have a significant difference in the percentage of the harvest that's taken by rifle versus shotgun. Um, and shotgun still maintains the highest percentage of of the harvest. Um, rifle, the percentage of the harvest taken by rifle has increased, but I would have to get you that information. And I can provide that to you in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess the next question I would have would be things have changed a lot in your career. And you know, Chris, Chris Rosenberry says season length does not affect total harvest. And that's because he has control of the tax. He has control of the permits. You don't. Okay. Is it time to start mm -hmm. thinking in that direction? For, or for, at least, for at least fall. That that could. Um, however, I would have to change my population model. Well, of course. Um, so. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean today. Yeah. I mean over the next. You know, I mean, you, certainly as a scientist, you ought to be able to look at that thing and see the trend where we're headed. And I would think that you would want a very high degree of certainty. I mean, you're, you're, you're rolling the dice a lot, too. Yes, yes. A couple of days here and a couple of days there, and depending on weather. Right, and that's the other reason why, um, you know, a, a two-week continuous season versus a one-week then you, you know, have a, a lapse, then a, just a three-day season doesn't really provide the opportunity right. because of weather and because right. of sickness and because of, you know, So if we want to provide the most opportunity for people to get outdoors and hunt, those are some things that we can talk about and think about, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Okay. And, you know, requiring a tag, um, would give you a higher degree of certainty. I don't mean the boards, and the 
you, you would have a higher degree of certainty. Yes, but I would not want that this year because <laughs> no, I don't even know how to ask No, so I'm not suggesting that. Okay. Mary Jo, this is the, I know we're talking about the fall, but having the two broadly tags in the spring, you didn't, how does that play into this with your fall harvest? I mean, I've heard you say before that uh, it doesn't, is that still the case? Is this yeah. the keep harvesting two bubbles is on a material effect on the population? Correct, and, and um, so the, the, main, the main biological aspect that with the spring season is open, the opening day, and we have that down. So we open the we open the season the Saturday closest to May first because uh, through our research we know that that's sort of right around when the majority of the hens are actually incubating their nests and so. So uh, if I had to pick one word to describe uh, what happened in 2019 with bears, the word would be record. That's what I would. That's the word that describes everything. And we can look at record opportunity. Um, you know, if you look what we've done with bears in the last 20 years in Pennsylvania, we, you know, in 2000 we had a, uh, a three-day season. In 2002 we had an extended season that was in five percent of our bear range. Today that's in 70 percent of our bear range. We had an archery season in 2006. We moved seasons into concurrent with deer for both the extended and the archery. Um, we extended the general season to four days, we moved it to the Saturday opener. So we did a lot, and by 2018, we were up to 16 days of bear hunting over most of the bear range. And then, of course, in 2019, uh, we doubled that. We went to 30 days of bear hunting over 70% of the bear range in, in the state. The last time that we had 30 days of bear hunting in Pennsylvania was 1931. So uh, really, it was a record. Uh, it was a record year for bear hunting opportunity in the state. And, and so it should be no surprise that with that amount of opportunity, we had record participation. Uh, we sold over 202,000 bear licenses. Um, this was the greatest single year increase that we had had uh, at any point since we created the bear license back in 81. We, uh, we added 27,000 bear hunters um, to our bear, hunting, uh, our bear hunting family here in the state. It was a 16% increase that over 8,000 uh, non-resident bear hunters. And when I, uh, I think back to when I got here in 2000 about going to, to meetings outside of the state, to other states, and telling other people that we had 100,000 bear hunters and how uh, unbelievable that number was to think that we're here we are today at twice that, we're over 200,000 um, uh, bear hunters in, in Pennsylvania. We, we really are uh, a leader now in, in terms of, of bear management and bear hunting here in the East. So with that much opportunity and that many hunters, um, it should also be no surprise that we had a record harvest. Uh, the final number is going to commit at 4,653 bears. It's only the third time that we've exceeded 4,000 bears. And, uh, and like uh, license sales, it was the largest single year increase we've ever had. Even back in 2011, our uh, second highest year, that year was only 1,300 bears above the 2010 harvest. But last year, we increased the harvest to 1,500 bears from 2018. So um, it was not only a record year, it was a record increase and a record harvest. But what's really interesting is where we've come with um, how that harvest is distributed across the seasons. We look back, we think about the year 2000 um, when we had just a three-day season. We look at 2002 when we added the extended season and, and in 06 when we added the archery season. Both of those new seasons went on to have increasing harvest, but they remained for years still kind of a minor part of the total bear harvest. We always managed to have about two-thirds of our bear harvest in our general hunting season, in our, what we call our, our regular bear season. But this year, we actually had four big bear seasons. We no longer have just one um, bear season and a few extra seasons. We have four major bear hunting seasons. We had three seasons that had over a thousand bears each. Um, you know, if you look at the mid-1980s, um, total harvest was between 1,100 and 1,600 bears. Well, we had three seasons this year 
that had that level of harvest. And even the archery season at 561 bears is now a significant player uh, in total bear harvest. So that what this means is we no longer have one opening day, we have four opening day effects. Um, we no longer have um, you know, one day to take about most of our harvest occurring, and we have four seasons now when, when most of that harvest is occurring. So it, it really is um, exciting to see these, the, these types of records being set and how this harvest is, how the hunters have responded and changed their, their hunting behavior. And if you look at what we would have predicted to happen this year, if you would have looked at historical harvest over the last six to seven years and <coughs> kind of predicted where we, what would have happened with the changes in 2019, you know, we have seen a steady decline in our general season harvest. Um, and this is largely due to adding new seasons, adding new opportunity, hunters kind of uh, reallocating their time to these other seasons. But if we would have drawn a line through those, um, those points prior to 2019, we would have pretty much nailed it for 2000. Our prediction would have been right where the 2019 general season harvest fell, fell at 1629. And the same is true with extended season. Um, if we would have uh, used the last seven years to predict where that line that, that um, <coughs> line would fell, would have fallen right where we would have expected, right around 1,100 bears. And that's even with the uh, Saturday uh, opener for deer hunting being part of the extended season. That's with the shift from four days to six days over a lot of units. But still, we fell right where we would have predicted it to be. Um, archery season was the same way. You know, we doubled the season last year. But if you look at kind of trend there, what we saw in 2019 is right where we expected it. So even though two of those three seasons there were, were records, uh, the extended season is a record high, the archery season is a record high, um, they all fell about where we expect. The one real surprise, though, was our muzzleloader <coughs> season. And so um, it's good that these other three seasons kind of fell where we expected them to be. So that gave us an extra latitude to, um, to have a muzzleloader season that we really didn't um, expect to be at that level. Uh, that 1,300, uh, 1,340 bears, less than 300 of those bears occurred in the firearms component. So really what we're talking about is the muzzleloader season. We had over 1,100 bears uh, harvested with muzzleloaders in that, in that week. And so if any of those other seasons, if the archery or the extended or the general, had been much greater than we predicted, then we may not be as comfortable as we are today with 4,600 bear harvest or a 1,300 bear harvest in the muzzleloader season. But because those other three seasons kind of fell out where we expected them to, um, the total harvest even with a large muzzleloader season, is still um, about, you know, in the, in the range that we're comfortable with. And, I, and I'll cover a little bit more of that here in a minute. But we not only had a record harvest, record opportunity, record participation, we also had a record bear population. Um, 875 bears were tagged last year for population monitoring. We looked for those tags in the harvest check stations that allows us to do a population estimate. And what we saw was I uh, came in at 20,000, a little over 20,000 bears. We went into the, the hunting season last fall with around 20,000 bears statewide. And so how did that record harvest impact that large bear population, that population of 20,000 bears? And the way, we, the way we evaluate that or the way we measure that is the harvest rate Harvest rate is the percentage of the population removed by hunting. And, and we measure that with ear tag bears. Uh, we look to see what percentage of the bears we tagged this year show up in the harvest. And um, last year it was 23%. And so um, you, there's a couple things I want to point out about that number. First off, it's within the historical range. If you kind of look at where harvest rate has been over the last 20 years, um, it, it has remained, for the most part, between about 16 to 19 percent, or 16 to 24 percent. And um, so, what we observed in 2000 or in 2019 at 23 percent, even though that's a record high, even though it's the largest single-year increase, it still falls within that historical range. So that that gives us a little bit of comfort um, in that very large harvest. Um, and I also want to point out that we have had other years at that level also, 2005 was a 23% harvest rate year, and yet you can see where our bear population did 
after 2005. You know, we did not see dramatic declines in the population in those years after 2005. So, with this harvest rate at around 23 percent, and three out of the four seasons um, falling within the range that we would have predicted, um, and total harvest being in that around that 4,600 bears, 4,700 bears. Um, we are comfortable with proposing the same seasons again for 2020. But uh, even, even though, uh, you know, this, it's, it's exciting times right now, the record harvest, um, producing harvest rates that we're comfortable with, we're able to, to continue to propose the same seasons for another year. I, I do want to temper all of that just a little bit uh, by pointing out uh, female harvest rate. Um, and that's the percentage of our adult, adult females that were harvested in 2019. The average is around 11 uh, percent. Last year it was 19 percent, which is the highest it's ever been, and it's about twice what the average uh, that average of 11. And so we um, we are going. This is something we are going to keep our eye on. And one of the questions is is having earlier seasons in October. We know that bears in October have different behaviors than bears in November. Their, their foraging um, behaviors are different. Um, how they move around on the landscape uh, is changing as they get closer to hibernation. So they, they tend to move out of their home ranges more looking for food earlier in the fall. And so when we hunt, when we, we start to have these large bear hunting seasons in October, what effect does that have on the vulnerability of our female bears? Um, and so this is something we want to look at, and we actually began a study this year um, looking at that question. We partnered with South Dakota State University, and one of the neat things about this partnership is that we are going to be able to use data that we're already collecting on existing, existing projects. Um, we have about 70 female bears right now that are radio collared in the state that are collecting data with GPS collars for other projects, and we're going to take that data and, and with this partnership with South Dakota, analyze that data with, uh, with a new question in mind, and that is how do the factors that affect female harvest, um, uh, what factors affect female harvest, and, and what is that relationship with these new hunting opportunities, specifically earlier bear hunting. Um, and the questions we're looking at are, you know, are these bears more vulnerable in these earlier seasons, especially if these earlier seasons become big players in our, in our total harvest, if they are more vulnerable, why? And how might this affect the resource in the long run? So this is something um, that you're going to hear more about in the next couple of years. Uh, we have a graduate student on that project. And um, the nice thing is we get to use the data that we're already collecting for that. Well, Mark, I think one of the things we we'll also want to make clear is that if these trends continue and we start to see a decline in the population, these seasons are set in stone. I mean, we can roll those down. We want to make that abundantly clear to everybody that while the opportunity is there, um, we're going to make these seasons available. And if something would happen that we see our, our bear population start to decline, we would obviously cut these seasons back. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we should have a lot of pride in the fact that, that we can harvest almost 4,700 bears, that we have 200,000 bear hunters. There's, there's not another state that comes close. And um, so from the management side, you know, that, that's amazing what we're able to do here. But we also have the best monitoring program of, of any state <coughs> in the country when it comes to our bear populations. Um, our tagging program is, is a one of a kind. It's, it, when we talk to other states, we ask them, what would you like to do? They will say, well, I'd like to do it like Pennsylvania does. Uh, because they, they really have a good program. And so it's bear check stations, it's our tagging program, it's all of these things, and it's an agency-wide effort. You know, it's not just um, one person is doing that. And so if there's a problem, if something, if something happens, we'll know it, and we'll know it within a year, because um, those programs are there for collecting that data on an annual basis. And so um, I agree with you that uh, I think we're safe proceeding here, and if something um, if becomes a problem, we'll know it, we'll bring it to the board's attention. It, it's funny because then, dude, Commissioner Hoover and I were out in Colorado State one time for a seminar, and one of the questions they asked was they pointed at Brian and they said, Pennsylvania, how many bears did you harvest last year? And he said 3,500. And somebody from the crowd said, not how many do you have in the state, how many did you harvest? And they just can't believe the, like, the, the number of deer we harvested. The, the opportunities in Pennsylvania are just outstanding. 
and, and I think that sometimes we take that for granted. But I do, I want to echo what, uh, what Jenny said, and, and thank you for stepping out. I know this was a huge step uh, for the agency and, and for you to let go of um, some of these seasons, and I appreciate it. I just want to extend my thanks. How about the size of our bears? Well, you know, well, we had an 800 pound bear uh, in this past year's harvest. The last one, I think, was 2005 or so. We've had half a dozen in the last 20 years. There, there's no other state that can, that can say that. Um, we routinely have several dozen 600, 700 pound bears in the harvest every year. So, uh, and that's a, that is a result of having a healthy bear population. You know, we, the fact that we can sustain <coughs> 3,500, 4,500 now bears. Um, part of the ability to do that is the fact that the population is healthy, and the consequence of that is that we have large bears. In 2017, Dr. Jagnow gave a presentation explaining the motivations behind Pennsylvania hunters. And of all those motivations that people identified in the market research focus groups, spending time with family and friends was on the top of their list. Among those who identified as being an active hunter, 90% agreed or strongly agreed. And of those that identified as less than active as a hunter, still 88% of those either agreed or strongly agreed. While the economic impact of the move is yet to be quantified, it's clearly evident the social component within Pennsylvania's hunting tradition is extremely important. James Daly, the former commissioner who spearheaded the effort to push the Saturday opener forward, whom I've had a number of conversations with concerning the matter, stunned many when he slammed the brakes just minutes before the move was called to vote. Daly made a motion on the floor to revert back to the Monday opener. However, commissioners decided to stay the course and pushed it through. A week later, Daly resigned. He was quoted as saying, when people won't look at the data in front of them and come up with a logical decision, I don't want to be a part of it. I'm afraid the Pennsylvania Game Commission is in for a difficult road with this Saturday opener. For that, it should come as no surprise that Commissioner Daly appeared to give testimony at the January 24th, 2020 public comment session. Auditor General's Audit Report. 
has become a rallying cry for those often opposed to the PGC. Yet, there was no misuse of funds, no hiding of information, no wrongdoing. Sure, internal controls were found lacking, as they typically are in almost every audit of public and private organizations. All can improve their internal controls. The agency also was called out for a new bureau chief not knowing details of the escrow account, which were portrayed as nefarious slush funds. The PGC's messaging should have said that anyone with a mortgage has an escrow account for payment of taxes and insurance. Escrow funds are held by a third party for specific expenses. Expenses, they are useful tools. The agency also was slammed for carrying a large reserve in the game fund. However, the governor's budget office throttled the agency spend. Windfalls from oil and gas revenues, which will be declining substantially with extremely low natural gas prices, <coughs> rapidly inflated the fund with no authorization to spend down. The public's perceptions from the audit show how poorly the messaging was managed and revealed the PGC must improve its working relationships and interactions with the governor's office of administration and the office of budget to access the agency funds. Speaking of accessing the agency's own funds, the Pine Tuning Wildlife Center, Learning Center, has been in limbo for about six years. The irony is the PGC took the project back from the DGS due to perceived unsatisfactory progress, but of course the PGC has done much work. Please get it funded and built as soon as possible. It is a vital resource to instill appreciation for the outdoors and promote hunting. It will rapidly regain its prominence as a destination to educate the public on vital wildlife issues like CWD, West Nile virus, Lyme disease, and raptor-led toxicity. Just this year, Tamarack Wildlife Center, near Pompatoon, took in seven eagles with toxic lead levels. Treatments were expensive, oftentimes unsuccessful. The PGC must continue its toxicity education efforts and tap agency funds to donate to these rehabbers. Lastly, the PGC needs to be more nimble and responsive. I see this as a hunter-ed instructor because it's taken forever to get emerging issues like CWD, West Nile virus, Lyme disease, and lead toxicity into the curriculum. Let's hope the new partnership with the University of Pennsylvania can become a shining example of responsiveness. Right now, hunters need better, more rapid detection tools for CWD, make this a priority. May I suggest that you apply a simple first responder axiom when you're setting regulations. First, do no harm. Even when you think you may help some subset of hunters, always ensure you're not harming the many to help with you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments?